Ladies and gentlemen, our event is ready to begin. Paul, take it away. Thank you, Meredith, and hello, everyone. Welcome to Smart versus Dumb IT Capacity Management, moving from struggling to strategic in three steps. This is a webcast presented by Uptime Software. My name is Paul Gillen. I'll be your host and moderator, and we're delighted to see so many of you here today. In a moment, we'll hear from David Leith, Capacity Guru and Technical Product Manager at Uptime Software. But first, a little housekeeping to attend to. During the webcast, our speaker slides will be pushed to your screen automatically. If you want to view the presentation full screen, look for that little green Maximize button at the top right of the window. You can also drag the corner of the presentation window to reduce or enlarge its size. You'll also see some widgets along the bottom of the console. Click on the green Download Slides widget to access the presentation in PDF format. You'll also see a Resources widget, which I encourage you to click. Uptime has provided a lot of bonus resources for this webcast, so be sure to see if they can help you. Our Q&A slide at the end of the presentation also has links to a checklist, a cost calculator, and free trial. You'll find all those links in the slides you download. Now, after David finishes his prepared remarks, he'll field your questions. You can submit a question by typing it into the text box on your webcast console and clicking Submit. We'll either answer your question in the Q&A portion or personally in an email to follow. And given that we have quite a few people here today, I'd encourage you to ask your questions early. Don't worry about dumb questions. If the question is answered already in the presentation, we'll simply skip over it. Also, Uptime Software representatives will be live tweeting during the event. You can tweet them at, at Uptime Software or with the event hashtag, which is pound IT capacity. You can see that Twitter stream, by the way, live on your console. You should be able to see it now. Finally, there will be two polls during this presentation. When the questions pop up on your screen, please answer them so David can target the rest of his remarks appropriately. So with that said, let's move on to today's topic. A lot of great technology has come online in recent years to make IT infrastructure more flexible. In particular, virtualization enables resources to move fluidly through the organization and machines to be deployed and managed as needs demand. Technology is also increasingly being deployed into the field at the point of sale and even into the hands of traveling employees. Computing really is becoming ubiquitous. But there's downside to all this goodness, too. Capacity management is becoming a nightmare. With so many platforms to manage, and we're talking both physical and virtual, traditional tools and methods are falling behind. In many cases, the complexity of the environment now exceeds the capacity of human administrators to manage it effectively. And this can result in frequent outages or performance problems. Alternatively, it can cause companies to overspend on capacity just to be safe. The solution is to simplify the traditional approach of capacity planning and focus on the fundamentals that allow you to nip problems in the bud before they become crises. David Leith will discuss a simple framework to take the guesswork out of capacity management, tying business metrics to infrastructure and enabling IT organizations to get proactive in their capacity management process. Dave has 15 years of management experience in technology, client services, and military environments. And in his nine years with Uptime Software, he has worked closely with users in hundreds of data centers across the world, earning him the esteemed title of Capacity Guru. So, David, uh, our guru, we're going to hand it over to you. All right. Thank you very much, and uh, thank you again, everyone, for coming today. I'm very excited to be here talking about uh, some of my experiences working in, in large-scale data centers with you know, enterprise clients who have real challenges trying to manage their own capacity and get proactive about capacity planning in their environment. So today I'm going to share a basic framework that uh, we, we've utilized in a number of different clients. Right? So we, we've walked into a lot of environments that are just really struggling, particularly with, with virtualization and the new rate of change in environments, struggling to, to stay ahead of the curve and ensure that their applications are available and the performance issues aren't impacting their day to day. So I'm going to talk about three steps uh, using an example of one of our clients uh, th that we can go through to help simplify the IT management, IT capacity problem, and help move your organization forward. So the first thing I'm going to talk about is how to make the case for capacity management in your environment. If you're, if you're in a current environment that just doesn't do any real capacity management, uh, I'll share some pointers on uh, how to start that conversation and then certainly get management involved in moving forward with the capacity plan. I'll then talk about building a, a framework to gain control of your current IT capacity position. So understanding where you are today is the first step in being able to analyze and interpret your data and plan for future growth. 
And then I'll talk about probably the most important step, which is how to get, uh, get to a reactive stage instead of uh, being always behind the eight ball and always worrying about things that are, that are going on. Let's try to get really proactive and, and manage the problem, stay ahead of, uh, of the problem in your environment. And then I'll also talk at the end briefly about uh, some specific tips and tools for effective capacity planning uh, management. So before I get into the, the meat of things, let's talk a little bit about why this capacity management problem is, is so important, and particularly if you aren't looking closely at this today, today why you should be. The, the first number I'd like to share with you is on the performance side. We find the, in working with our users, and this has been mirrored in a number of uh, analyst reports, that about 65% of all help desk tickets either relate directly or closely to capacity issues. So these are all issues that really could have been avoided. So think about the amount of time that uh, companies spend being reactive and responding to issues that are related to performance instead of being able to stay ahead of those things and rule those problems out. The second reason it's so important is really all about money. So we call this the, the IT capacity enigma, and I'll talk more about that in the, in the next slide. But we find that most of our users, uh, when they really look at their resources, both from the, the CPU memory side, the, the physical resources and SAN side, time and staffing, they end up wasting somewhere between 30 and 50% of resources. So either they've bought far too many uh, servers to try to accommodate uh, capacity that may not be there, or they've misallocated resources in their environment. Right? It's, it seems to be that in every environment, there's never quite enough, and you start planning ahead, getting really far ahead of where you actually need to be, and a lot of it ends up being wasted. Of course, SAN is a little bit different in this regard. No matter how much SAN you have, it tends to be filled. Now, time and staff is interesting because it's, it's often overlooked, but if we relate capacity issues back to those 65% of help desk tickets, that's an incredible amount of staff time spent managing those issues when those staff could have been focusing on more important things, such as you know, ensuring that those, uh, those applications are available and planning for the future. So I'm going to talk about a specific client today uh, and, and how they were able to use this framework to, to move forward in their capacity planning. So the, this client I'll just represent is you know, Dennis. So Dennis was hired on to a, a new company as a senior application manager. Uh, he came into a, a major Canadian telecommunications company, was one of our local phone companies. And he was one of a team that was responsible for managing capacity of around 40 different application clusters covering thousands of different server instances. And he, he found when he arrived that they were really stuck in this hole, right? They were having all kinds of outages uh, related to capacity. They were never really sure what their capacity really was and if they were using it. And their approach to capacity planning w was all done in Excel, right, and largely based on guesswork. They had a weekly process whereby every Friday at around noon, all the different application managers would sit in a room together and review the capacity, the real-world performance of these applications over the last week. Now, these meetings were interesting because in a 40-hour week, it actually took much longer than 40 hours just to prepare the basic metrics that would be reviewed on that Friday at noon. So you'd be spending around 60 to 80 hours to pull together the, the capacity info for these 40 application clusters. And then all of the, the application managers would sit in a room talking about the capacity and, and its impact on the business, and they would never end up trusting each other's metrics. They would sit there second-guessing uh, all of the numbers that had been put into the Excel spreadsheet, doubting the basic arithmetic and logic uh, that was put into the capacity numbers. And the end result for their business was really a state of inertia. They were never able to really move forward and get proactive about capacity. They were always stuck not trusting each other, pointing fingers, and just spending a lot of time trying to get a basic understanding of what's the capacity in your environment and where do we need to change. So we were able to help Dennis uh, using this three-stage uh, process look at that problem or they had with capacity management, implement a basic system to, to move forward, and the end result is that they, they were able to make effective forward-looking decisions about capacity and improve service delivery, application delivery to their end users. So the first step that we took Dennis through was all about making your case. So in Dennis's environment, uh, they, had, they had a number of different tools collecting all kinds of different capacity info, but they didn't really view the capacity problem as something valuable enough that they, they needed uh, to move forward with. And there, there are a few reasons for that. 
And the first one is that the, there was a, te a tendency within the data centers he was working in to really view the capacity problem and solving it uh, properly as a huge undertaking, right? As a you know a million dollar problem. But the reality is that for 80% of companies, you don't need to go and spend hundreds of thousands or millions of dollars on a capacity planning tool. You need a tool that will allow you to answer three basic questions. The first one, simply, how much capacity do I have? What do I have out there? New servers are spinning up constantly. There's always provisioning of new systems in different environments. There's cloud resources now. Maybe you have a, a private cloud or a hybrid cloud environment. It becomes very difficult, especially using a collection of tools, to understand how much capacity you have. The second problem, once you know how much you have, is just are you using it? Right, so if we have, say, you know, 100,000 uh, gigahertz of power that, that we know is available in the environment, how much are we using? Are we using 50% of that, 70% of that? And then the third question, most importantly, when will I run out? Capacity management doesn't have to be an enormously complicated process. Most organizations struggle simply to answer these three questions, but they get distracted about thinking about the, the bigger picture of capacity planning versus focusing on just these three things. Right? So distilling down the complicated capacity planning environment to just three questions can help change uh, the internal perception of capacity planning and make it something that's easier to, uh, to move up on the priority scale and schedule sooner. The next reality about making, making your case for capacity planning is that we really need to focus on capacity planning as a business problem, specifically in being able to build trust that IT can support the business as it grows. So three example questions uh, that Dennis would face, you know, can we expand sales of our, of our mobile phones by more than 50%? Will our website handle 100 or a million visitors this month? Can we hire 10% more staff and, and have the appropriate IT resources to, uh, to take care of those people? These are business level questions that a typical CIO or CEO will ask of IT, and capacity planning is really the essential to be able to defensively answer these questions and know with absolute certainty that yes, if we do take on 50% increase in sales, we know IT will, uh, will be able to handle that. We know that application availability won't suffer in your environment. But there's a tendency, certainly on the technical side, to focus this capacity planning at a much more low-level, um, granular point of view. So specifically, you know, down to the database layer, individual server layers. That's only the beginning of the problem. The, the real value in capacity planning comes by being able to answer these business questions related to the availability of your, of your IT services. And the third piece of, of really making your case is enforcing the, and, and bringing light on that IT enigma, so the overspend versus underprepared scenario. So we talked about 30 to 50% of physical resources being unused except for storage. That's a lot of wasted capital costs that could be spent more effectively in your environment. And then, of course, 65% of all service outages relate to a capacity issue. Many organizations haven't really connected the dots on these things, so they certainly know that perhaps they have a little bit too much capacity available. Um, they'll, they'll buy hardware in uh, large chunks just to keep ahead of the, the cycle for the upcoming three months. But that can lead to a, a lot of wastage, right? And the, the real cost of that wastage, waste on the, the capacity side or on the, the procurement side uh, isn't always realized right away, right? And certainly not necessarily realized at the business decision uh, maker level, more realized at the lower, uh, lower level IT people level who understand, yes, we have all these servers that are available, but they're not doing much. You know what, it's okay. Right? That's, a, that's the sysadmin or lower level manager's point of view, but really for the person signing the checks up at the, up at the top of the corporation, knowing that those resources aren't being utilized effectively is a big no-no in the environment. So after making your case, you should move on to simply getting started with, with proper capacity management. So I'm going to talk about five steps that, uh, that you can use to go from kind of zero capacity planning in your environment or ineffective capacity planning to something that should help you move forward the whole, uh, the whole conversation. 
So the first thing that you need to do in your environment is all about building trust. So we talked about Dennis not being able to have a single set of data uh, that, that all of the different application managers could actually trust. In their case, they had eight different tools monitoring different components of their environment. What you really need to get to is a unified platform that will monitor the basic performance metrics, you know, be it CPU, memory, network load, disk and storage, or queue depths, uh, across all of your different technology silos. So across the network side, the database application servers, the, the physical server, Windows, Linux teams, everyone needs to view, the, view a single tool so they have a single version of the truth. And they can look at each other's metrics and believe those metrics and understand where those metrics are coming from. Having that foundation of trust is the first step in being able to move forward. And most importantly here, don't use Excel. If you're using Excel for capacity planning, pulling in data from a bunch of different sources, you, you will constantly be hindered by that. Excel is a great tool for a number of different purposes, for, for, but for real capacity planning, it simply isn't effective and uh, is kind of an archaic approach in today's modern data center. The second step to getting started is all about defining your capacity needs in a single unit of measure. Now this is where most organizations will end up falling apart. There's a, a lot of challenges here because it really draws the conversation about capacity planning from those lower level metrics back up to the business level. And that business level, understanding the business processes that IT is, is driving is, is essential to understanding the, the true value of what's going on here. So the first thing that you should identify for your own capacity needs is what are the workloads? And these workloads are more of the business-facing metrics. So the who, what, and how. So for example, um, we, we would like an end user or a consumer to be able to come to our website, click on ad, ad or purchase new plan, go through these three steps in the website, and at the end come out having successfully uh, added a new long distance package to their, uh, to their service, for example. That high-level workflow, simply understanding where the end user is going through the website, seems like a pretty simple concept, and at the highest level it is, but it's also very difficult to translate that down into terms that are understand by, under, understood by the IT people who are actually delivering these applications. So the IT people would more understand that to actually process an order, it's a series of different you know, financial systems and CRM systems that need to be updated. Those things are all interesting, but they aren't actually factors in that end user experience, that workload that you need to plan, plan against. is all about that higher level end user experience. So once you've defined that workload, so the who, what, and how, business level, what needs to be accomplished, you should then take that conversation back down to some of those units of work. So what do those actual front end activities mean from an IT point of view? So are we able to identify you know, either at the transactional level, requests, page load type level, more metrics that, uh, that IT people are comfortable? Are we able to identify how many of those things go into each of those front end workloads? So this conversation, simply understanding the workloads and units, the units of work that, uh, that compose those workloads, it, it can take months potentially to, to get there. But you shouldn't let that deter you. Right? The, the first steps are simply understanding the, the basic con uh, concepts and being able to agree primarily between the business side and the technology side, what are these units of measure, and get everyone to agree on that. Once you have those units of measure, the third piece would be defining your desired service levels. Now, desired service levels is always an interesting conversation um, because generally the, the desired service level is always well beyond what the actual acceptable uh, service level is for that front-end front -end application. So taking that example of, of coming online to, to add a new package to your, your cell phone service, Certainly, uh, it, it will always be said that, yes, that uh, must run 100% of the time without any failures, and the whole process must complete in two seconds. Well, that's an, in an ideal world. But understanding these service levels will allow you to go and really look at the cost of loss versus the cost of service that you're providing. Certainly on the business side, it's not always easy to understand that achieving that 99.9% .9 availability will cost X thousands of dollars in infrastructure and, uh, and servers to drive that. 
knowing what that unit of measure is and how the, the technology backend um, processes the, those front end requests will allow you to have a, a, a pro proactive conversation between uh, the business side and the technology side and really agree on service levels that are functional and service the end user well without being dramatically more expensive than what your company is willing to pay. So once you've gone through uh, you know, building that trust with a unified monitoring uh, platform, then defining what your needs are, you're ready to move on to the next three steps. Now, I think before we move on to the next steps, we're going to pause for a moment for our first polling question. We are going to do that, David. Uh, we want to get a level set on the audience, and the question, if uh, we would, uh, the question will appear on your screen in a moment. Our first poll question is about what do you use for capacity planning today? No planning in place, Excel or other spreadsheets, very bad from what David said. A capacity reporting tool or a capacity forecasting tool. So please uh, register your answer, one answer only, and uh, we'll look at the results in a moment. I want to, again, take this opportunity to remind you to submit your questions. We've got a lot of people here today, so if you want to get questions into David, um, get them in early uh, so we have a good chance to answer them. Uh, with that said, why don't we take a look at the results we've had in just these uh, 30 seconds or so. And it looks like, David, uh, Excel is uh, still the popular tool for capacity planning, although some dedicated tools are, are coming up, but nothing in the forecasting area at this point. Um, maybe we can refresh that poll once more to see if we got any more questions in, uh, any more answers in, refine those results a little bit more. And uh, it looks like uh, uh, still Excel is, is, is the big winner. Does that surprise you, David? Um, it, it doesn't. You know, I've, I've worked with a, a lot of different organizations, and it's, it's always amazing how many of them are using Excel or really have no capacity planning uh, in their environment. So it's, it's not particularly uh, surprising. You know, certainly here we're seeing well over half of the crowd uh, who, who don't really have a, a proper capacity reporting tool, uh, and even less that, are, that have a forecasting tool to help them look to the future. Okay, well, please continue. All right, so moving on to step three in, in getting started. Right, the, the, the next step you want to take once you've um, established that baseline or, or that ability to collect all your different performance metrics using a unified platform, you've gone through defining what you think uh, you want all of your workloads to be and your, your transactional uh, lower level pieces have a basic understanding of the, of the service level you want to provide, now you can start moving into the, the analysis uh, stage, really analyzing what is your current capacity. So with that tooling in place, you'd want to look at what type of capacity problems do you really have? You know, are, they, are there specific applications that are struggling? Are there areas that are you know, drastically overfunded from a capacity point of view that don't really need that? Getting to this stage usually introduces a number of aha moments or discovery moments for users where for the first time they can see capacity from that single view and start to identify where some of these problems lay. Now that you're doing this analysis, you'll want to start baselining and testing your assumptions. So I talked about that conversation between the business and IT about the, the levels of service and the, the capacity required to deliver different applications. Baselining is going to allow you to, to really look back and see whether you're delivering on those, uh, those targets today. And if you're not, how far off are you? What kind of capacity changes are needed quickly in your environment? And you should really be looking at a, a tool specifically that will allow you to do these types of baselines over 6 to 24 months of data. You know, certainly you can operate with a month of data to, to get started. You know, that's kind of the minimum we'd recommend. But definitely the, the six-month window, you'll start to be able to see long-term trends in your capacity. Certainly as seasonal changes, but this baselining will allow you to, to really lock down um, the, the application services you're trying to provide and ensure that you're, you're putting your best foot forward uh, for the current state of your environment. The next step after identifying where, where these problems are, of course, just put out the fires. You'd be amazed at how many uh, very basic things can be changed. Now you can see your, your capacity um, that will help dramatically reduce those number of incoming tickets related to capacity issues and improve overall service, uh, service delivery. So put out those fires uh, based on that baseline and the, those assumptions you're building. And the next step, 
of course, after you put out the fires, is all about getting proactive. All right, so you want to move into really analyzing the long-term trends on that data, starting to do effective planning and trending the, so you can stay ahead of capacity issues uh, as they come down the pipe. So how do you get proactive? So a lot of organizations, right, it's, it's a major milestone to, to get to the end of step two. So being able to argue for, for a better capacity planning solution, understanding the business impact of ineffective capacity planning and capacity management, implementing a basic system and getting to that level where the business and IT agree on the capacity service levels, that's a huge milestone. And uh, a lot of organizations would be very content to, to stay there. But the, the next step is really taking that baseline, all of that, uh, that fundamental groundwork that you've laid out, and moving on to a more proactive stance to help ensure that you are avoiding outages in your environment. So you can help uh, avoid outages by, first of all, understanding your workload's critical path. So once you've identified those, uh, those front-end workloads and the technical pieces that drive that and are able to view that from one source, understand where the critical path is and understand where your next most likely bottleneck is coming from. So if you know you have a disk problem in a certain environment, you should, you should always have that on the top of your list as the next piece that you need to look at to ensure that services stay up and running uh, for the months to come. Or if you have a CPU problem in a specific cluster, you know, have that top three list of, of areas that we need to to look at um, in that critical path and stay ahead of that. And of course, actively monitor your current capacity and, and react to any problems. You should be striving to have a, a single view or a dashboard that will highlight capacity in your environment and give you early warning of any upcoming problems so you can make adjustments to your plan, uh, help ensure that the, the eventuality of a problem never occurs, and you can maintain that stellar uh, service delivery record in your organization. The next step is all about being able to forecast workloads. So forecasting is, is always a tricky subject. You know, there are many tools out there that will cost you millions of dollars to do uh, kind of high-level forecasting. But a lot of organizations, again, don't really need that, or they'll go out and spend money on a, on a tool that does long-term forecasting and find that it doesn't really provide day-to-day -day value. So you're able to make the long-term forecast, but not able to translate that into day-to-day -day operational changes that will actually help drive that forecast plan. So there's a few different ways to, to tackle forecasting at a basic level. So the first is that you want to pick your strategy for forecasting. Um, strategies generally fit into either a leading approach, a lag approach, or a match approach. So of course the match approach is simply keeping your, your available capacity in line with the demands on your environment. So as new uh, demands come or go, you, you want to match that capacity uh, right to the number or as close as you can. The lagging approach is actually more typical in environments. So the, the lagging approach is where you will monitor your capacity and watch uh, the increase in capacity, but then only actually add new available resources and new server resources when, when you sort of hit that capacity peak, right? So you kind of wait for there to be a problem and then start adding capacity. Of course, this is very risky, but it's also the reality for a lot of different places. And of course, the, the lead uh, approach is purely the opposite of lag. It's keeping an eye on your capacity changes and the demands on your infrastructure and making sure that you're always staying kind of little chunks ahead. So maybe staying a month or two months ahead of your, uh, your capacity and your long-term trend, but not making the mistake of going six months or 12 months or even 18 months ahead of schedule. If you have an effective forecasting and, and monitoring solution for your capacity, you can more safely uh, take a lead approach to do smaller capital uh, purchases or smaller cloud purchases um, to, to stay just ahead of the, the resource demands without overspending and having a lot of wasted resources. Of course, you want to be able to plan for that future system usage, and this should all be about those front-end workloads, right? So not in technical terms necessarily, but you want to be able to go back to the business and say, if we do raise sales by this amount or have this many more registrations, here's how many servers we'll need to purchase to accommodate that and have that plan ready to go in case you need to, to put it in action. 
And the last one, of course, is just prepare for unknowns. Uh, every plan is, uh, is very effective on paper, but the reality of it is that things change, and things change very quickly in, in new dynamic environments. So having different plans available and, and different uh, potential options based on your known critical paths will, will allow you to very effectively maneuver around these unknowns and, and be ready the next time there is a, a potential problem in your environment. And the next piece about getting proactive is just all about automating and planning ahead. So of course you want to have routine reviews uh, of your, your capacity. You know, this should be an automated process. So you should have an email into your inbox at the end of every week or every month uh, highlighting the, the capacity of your critical applications and services. You shouldn't have to go out and, and manually pull all of this info together. You, you want to have an automated uh, tool that will put the right information in the hands of the right people at the right time. So these reviews should include those workload numbers, so being able to come back to the, the user transaction or, or user load, as well as, as your units of work and your current capacity, and be able to trend those things against each other effectively to, to plan ahead. And then you also want to be able to show what's your baselines versus reality. So if you've gone through all of this planning around the upcoming workloads and the, the reality of the, the increased demand or the reduced demand doesn't match up with your, your initial plans, well, it's time to adjust, right? And, and having a tool that makes it easy to see that information allows you to, to make those decisions without spending a lot of time focusing just on getting all of the data pulled together. So those routine reviews should happen you know, weekly or monthly. And then, of course, you'll always want to have a quarterly review that does go into the much longer term uh, kind of business objectives for your applications. So be it uh, you know, a, a corporate yearly plan and what that means to IT, uh, or a, a quarterly or six-month uh, plan. Uh, you'll want to have all the same info just done over a much longer time window, so looking at these trends over those, uh, those kind of one- and two-year elapsed windows. So those are the three steps, right? the three fundamental steps that will help take you today from um, either being in a position where you have no capacity planning in place, maybe capacity planning just isn't a focus in your uh, organization, maybe you're using basic spreadsheets or, or trying to do basic planning. By implementing these three steps, you can really uh, make the case in your environment get started with the basic capacity planning you need to make effective decisions using a unified tool, and then move on to being proactive in your environment. Now before I jump on to some, some specific examples, uh, some uh, you know, screenshots and tools and hits and tips, uh, we're going to stop for our next poll question. We are. We're going to have our second uh, poll question. Find out what a priority this is to our, our audience. Uh, the question, how would you rank capacity management issues in your data center? High priority, medium priority, or low priority? I uh, also want to note that we have had some questions about the presentation, whether it's recorded and will be available later. And the good news is that it is being recorded, and it should be available tomorrow. So if you are registered, keep an eye on your inbox. You'll get a notification when the uh, David's presentation, uh, the archive, is available, and you'll be able to share that with others in your company, uh, your colleagues, and we certainly encourage you to do so. That said, uh, let's take a look at the relative importance of this issue right now to our audience. Uh, high priority. Well, you've got no wonder you've got an attentive crowd here, um, <laughs> David. You've got uh, this is a priority for nearly everyone and a high priority for over half. So uh, maybe you can address uh, why this has uh, become such a, an elevated priority right now, or perhaps it always has been. Well, I think it always has been, but. Uh, certainly, it's it's always been a little bit of an easier problem, right? I think the uh, the expansion of virtualization technologies, of cloud resources, of the idea of uh, true, um, you know, co-location or, or hybrid type workloads, it's made capacity planning um, much more difficult, and and the resulting kind of outages uh, of that complexity ha have really resulted in a lot of lost dollars, a lot of lost revenue for organizations, or maybe something more simple such as just not realizing the performance enhancements that, uh, that your organization was expecting out of moving to a virtualized technology stack. So certainly capacity management is becoming harder, it's becoming more important to stay ahead of those trends and, and really know that as your workload changes in the, these virtualized environments that you're able to, to plan effectively and stay ahead of that. So it's so great, great to see that it is such a high uh, priority. Perhaps virtualization is too often uh, positioned as a panacea and turns out to be not, uh, not that. 
Oh, exactly. You know, like every technology, it uh, it has challenges rolling out effectively, and you don't always get the results that you were expecting. So, keeping an eye on capacity, being able to monitor your application performance and, and service delivery across the transition to to cloud or virtualized resources, uh, is is essential to your business and ensuring that you're you're meeting your IT goals. Okay, Dave. Well, we have quite a few questions that have come in, so uh, please continue. All right. So. Uh, th I'm going to talk very quickly about a, a few specific examples of some of the things I talked about in that framework. So the first thing I, I mentioned is just that ability to automate capacity uh, reporting and having the, the reports that you're interested in in your inbox at the right time. Um, this example report is a, is a report from Uptime um, that very simply identifies at the cluster level in a virtualized environment for four key performance capacity metrics being CPU usage, memory usage, disk I.O., network I.O., what's the current capacity of that entire cluster? All right, so, so what's both the available capacity and how much is being used? And then most importantly, there's also a trend here indicating what has it been previously? Right? What, what is the month over month or the, the quarter over quarter comparison for capacity in these environments? Of course, this is from a lab environment, so it's not terribly interesting. Uh, but, but this is the type of report that in one screenshot at a glance, you can understand those long-term trends. You can run this report for a year and be able to identify year-over-year -year capacity, and that will run for you in a few seconds versus having to go and dig up all of this info from a dozen different tools. The second one is about understanding that critical path and, and how to find resource bottlenecks. This example report um, specifically looks at CPU capacity issues uh, across the environment and allows you to report on total CPU capacity in a, in a unified unit across all the different architectures. So being able to run one report across uh, you know, Spark architecture, Intel x86 architecture, Power architecture, you know, viewing all of that, C that uh, available CPU in a consistent unit of measure so that you can do an apples-to-apples -apples comparison across these different technology stacks. The, this report highlights that. In this case, we can see that there's a, a specific uh, server here. It happens to be a Solaris server um, that is having some CPU problems, and you want to go look at that uh, as your kind of first order of business to understand where that server fits into your overall application delivery um, from a capacity point of view and understand, is this really a bottleneck that needs to be addressed right now? Is it one of those top three things that we need to go look at to avoid an outage in the future? I also talked about how to review your live capacity. So this is an example dashboard um, that Dennis was able to use to, to put up in his network operations center to give everyone in the room a basic idea across the entire data center's entire infrastructure What's your total CPU usage, right? What is the, the max and minimum being over the last 24 hours? Same thing for your memory usage, your, your disk percent busy, as well as your disk capacity. And then what are some of the hour-by-hour -hour trends for, for each of those metrics as well? So this is a, an always-on heads-up display that allows you to see any changes in your short-term capacity trend so you can start to drill down and identify where there's potential issues and resolve them again before there's any sort of application outage in your environment. Now, coming back to you know, why we're talking about this, so again, the, the, the real value in capacity, uh, capacity planning and effective capacity management comes back to the, the performance issues associated with not doing this uh, as well as you could be. 65% of help desk tickets that are relating directly or indirectly to, to capacity issues, all of those things can be proactively avoided instead of reacting to them. Then we have the money associated with those, uh, those outages as well as just misallocated resources. So 30 to 50% of all capital costs for uh, compute power and sand power. And then staffing time. So 65% of help desk tickets is an incredible amount of staffing time. Um, and also really factors into you know, kind of the embarrassment uh, potentially associated with not effectively delivering uh, applications or services in your environment when you know the capacity could have been managed uh, more effectively up front to avoid the outage altogether. It, it can have a big impact on the, the reputation of IT to, to not be able to answer some of those key questions about changes to the business, right? So increased sales, increased staff, increased uh, application load. You want to be able to confident, confidently answer those questions so that IT is, is reputable and able to prove back to the business that, yes, IT will meet, meet the demands of the business changes that are ongoing. 
So of course, uh, you know, I am from Uptime Software, so if you would like to, to do an Uptime proof of concept, uh, you can download it from our website and be up and running in less than an hour. You can get access to that real capacity information in a management-ready format that can be uh, sent out in a nice PDF or an email uh, within a week. Right? And you can start to go along this, uh, this process of getting proactive about your capacity management. So there's a 30-day trial online uh, from our website, um, or you can to contact our sales team for a demo. And I think we're now going to pause for Q&A. Uh, that's right. We are pausing. Uh, we are going to take Q&A now. Uh, David, I'm going to give you a moment to familiarize yourself with some of the questions that have come into the Q&A queue and remind people that there are a number of resources you see on your screen right now, uh, the IT Systems Monitoring Checklist and the Feature Cost Calculator among them. Uh, you can also look at the uh, resources widget on your console for other assets that uh, Uptime has provided to help you with uh, your capacity management, management decision making. And um, remember that you can download this presentation. All of those links are, are hot in the uh, PDF of the presentation. So uh, with that said, uh, David, um, perhaps you had a chance to just quickly fly through some of the questions that have come in. Um, what would you like to take first? Uh, yeah, I'm just uh, still kind of scrolling through them. There's a lot of really great questions here, so let's see uh, what we're able to get to. Um, a moment. Uh, okay, I think I've uh, picked out the, the set that we can answer within the, the time we've got. All right, and... Um Uh, there is one here about uh, what if scenario planning and what you can uh, whether you support that or, or, or how that changes perhaps in a uh, more virtualized environment. Yeah, definitely. So, so uptime is able to um, to do all of the the previous trends uh, and identify that current capacity as as well as the short term trend to help you plan for um, you know forward movement and, and forecasting in in your environment. Now, what if scenario planning um, is, is definitely a kind of a higher order uh, problem, and you're going to find that in in tools that you know cost much much more than uptime, right? If you're in a state um, where where you're able to actually realistically do what-if scenario planning uh, at this point, you're all already well ahead of most organizations. So, so the reality is that many, many organizations never get to that what-if scenario, and they, they really find most of the value of capacity planning comes out of answering those three basic questions, you know, what do I have, am I using it, and when am I going to run out? Uh, a question about uh, installation. Is that typically performed by the system administrator or can application support teams do it? Uh, installation of uptime uh, is is rather straightforward. So we offer, um, of course, there's a, a core uptime monitoring station where all of your data is held. Um, uh, that uh, that's uh, stored in a centralized uh, location within your data center. So you uh, want uh, probably the IT team to take care of that. Um, but then configuring monitoring uh, of your different applications, it's absolutely something that uh, that the application team could do. And similarly, you know, the network team can roll out monitoring in their environment quite easily from the central console as well. Uh, we offer a combination of agent and agentless uh, monitoring across all the different platforms. So where there are APIs available, um, uh, such as VMware as uh, totally agentless, uh, or network devices, SNMP availability, um, the, there are agentless options for those environments, so it's very easy to, to roll up time out quickly across your entire data center. A question about some of the most common misconceptions people run into when they start looking into capacity planning. I'll bet, you can, I'll bet you've got a bunch of those. Uh, yeah, there's a lot of them, actually. I think, well, I, I think a lot of the, the misconception actually um, it comes back to the the over uh, complicated approach to capacity planning in general. So um, many people that I talk to assume that if they they really want to do capacity planning, that they need to get into all of this, you know, all of the the what if uh, scenarios and and really doing long term modeling in the environment, and, and they don't really realize you know how hard it is to get there, right? So it will take uh, certainly large data centers potentially years to get to that type of analysis. 
and then not really realizing that the, the real value in capacity management doesn't necessarily come out of those activities, right? So those activities may save uh, a great deal on future capa uh, capital costs, uh, so making the right decisions about buying servers, but they don't necessarily help support the day-to-day -day operations and the, the application availability, service availability in the environment. So I, I find that a lot of users really overcomplicate the problem. Instead of tep stepping back and asking what are the, the key essential things that I need to understand uh, and, and taking action on those things versus focusing on a goal that may be a few years away. And, of course, one of the complications is the differentiation between CPUs and cores. So we have a question here about how CPUs are differentiated from cores in terms of measuring capacity. Yeah, absolutely. And, and that's, um, you know, that, that's something that comes down to a technology-by-technology technology, uh, problem. So um, cores and CPUs in, a, in an IBM power environment are very different than, you know, Intel-based uh, cores and CPUs or even Spark-based, uh, you know, Niagara chips uh, with different threads and cores and CPUs. Um, and, and what you should be looking for is a uh, is a tool that is aware of all those nuances of the, of the different platforms and is able to, um, in a kind of generic way, roll up all of those those different values into something that you can compare and depend on across all of those architectures. Right. So uptime does do that and is able to uh, to allow you to do those capacity reports across the different technologies. But the the specific handling of each of those uh, those technology stacks is is a little bit different for each one. Uh, a question about, um, is your tool aligned with IDLE, I-T-I-L? Uh, generally speaking, yes, right? Um, yeah, the, there's a number of different uh, areas where uptime fits into the ITIL stack, um, so both um, Let's try. Sorry, I think they're in my head. So there, there's probably six different buckets where where uptime fits in, and those are mostly around the um, the service level management, capacity planning and management uh, buckets, as well as performance monitoring uh, and, and incident management buckets, right? Um, but it's you know it's a, it's a very broad framework, and depending on um, your specific implementation. Uh, uh, of ITIL in your environment, uh, you'll, you'll find that uptime uh, can fill a lot of those buckets or um, you know, either replace other tools or work uh, in conjunction with other tools to deliver the whole ITIL stack. There's certainly yeah, many, many levels of ITIL uh, compliance. Um, the question about deliverables is interesting. What type of deliverables do you see most of your customers using in formal reports and presentations to management? Uh, in terms of the, like the actual deliverables and Probably presentations, the well, I assume this refers to the metrics that the management wants to know about. Oh, the 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 key metrics, right? So what what management uh, typically wants um, is always you know much higher level than than IT is typically um, in a position to to provide, right? So. Um, a, a great example of a, a client similar to Dennis's environment I was working with recently. Um, you know, the, their CIO um, really wants a report that is just the you know the capacity availability of the the key business processes, right, or the service processes as as they call it. And this, in their case, would be something along the lines of the example I gave earlier. So a user will come to the website, they will log in, authentication will be working. They'll go to the the account history page, right? What's the the load time uh, on that type of page versus the the defined service level for that? Right? Um, how long did it take them to to place an order, right? And and so on and so forth, right? So management tends to look at kind of a much higher delivery um, map than what IT would look at. But the, the base metrics are, are always relatively simple, right? So they'll be focused uh, you know, largely on service time and availability, right, as well as number of transactions on aggregate uh, across that entire business process. And if you're able to, to roll all of those things into a report, you'd want to have the, the business-friendly metrics on that report um, directly related back to you know, the high-level overall capacity metrics that drive each of those buckets, so the available CPU capacity for for that process, um, the memory capacity, disk and network time uh, related back to the actual transaction times and load times. Uh, David, for this next one, I'm going to ask you to take a look at the question queue and look at the very top uh, question in the queue. And I'm not sure if this is a question that you would want to answer. It's a little um, unclear to me. 
you just take a look at that and decide if that's something you want to address? Uh, well, let's leave that one. It's a little ambiguous. Yeah, okay. Um, how much data do you need to start properly planning, uh, questioner asks. Uh, yeah, I spoke to that a little bit earlier in the presentation, so you, you can definitely get started um, with, with about a month of data, so that'll allow you to see at least over a, a few weeks uh, of performance what the typical trends are. Now, if you're brand new to monitoring or capacity planning, you can get started with a few days of data. Within a few, the, even a few days of data, you may be able to, be able to identify key areas where your performance just isn't what you thought it was, right? So if you have no visibility into the capacity on certain applications, simply getting a day of data may highlight for you specific applications that you need to go look at. Um, you know, we, we do recommend, you know, you can start with a few days, work up to a, a week, up to a month if you have no solutions collecting all that data, data already. But to really do a effective long-term planning, you'll, you'll need at least three months, and you should find a tool that will allow you to run very quick reports on, you know, six months to 24 months of performance data so you can really start to see those historics. Well, we have a question here from someone at a, a very large brand name retailer uh, about capacity planning for seasonal spikes in transaction volumes. What are some best practices for doing that? Well, the, the best practices in that, of course, first of all, is that you, know, you, you need to be able to track and, and uh, report on the previous season, right? So when we talk about those longer term uh, reports, you know, those six months and, and 12 months uh, type reports, you need to have a visibility into, you know, for this year, um, what, what was the capacity and where did it fall apart? You know, were there uh, specific bottlenecks that, um, that were identified through the reporting or specific applications that failed. You want to take a close look at the, those bottlenecks and those specific issues, identify them, resolve them, and then you need to be able to look forward, of course, to the next upcoming spike. And planning for that next upcoming spike is all about identifying those, those business level workloads, right? So the, this is an area where um, the, there's a lot of challenges, right, in, in planning for that type of event um, because you don't always know. Right, and so it's it's difficult to make any decision about the upcoming upcoming uh, seasonal change if you don't know what has happened in the the previous seasons iterations and spikes, and then if you're not also able to identify, you know, the the business says that they expect you know this uh, this upcoming sale to generate um, you know X new transactions or purchases per day. If you can't get an accurate measure on that, you won't really be able to to plan ahead. But if you're able to get a, a basic idea, um, say it's, you know, you're looking for 10% more or 20% more, you can start using that as a, as a framework uh, on top of the, the values from this year to plan ahead for the upcoming year. A member of our audience, uh, Tom Beer, asks, can you provide a definition of a workload and give a real-world example of a unit of work? Well, sure. I think the the, the workloads, um, and I'll come back to the example I've been talking through a, a few times here, is is all about the the business processes that are being driven. So not necessarily the application itself, but take it from a you know a consumer point of view. Um, you know, what are the the key stages and the the key things that your that end user or consumer needs to do with your application, right? So the, those would be the the workloads, and that's the the who, what, and how. So you know, who, um, uh, uh, typical end user or client, you know, what are they going to do? They're going to come to uh, my website and they're going to order a new product or something on sale. And how are they going to do that? They're going to step through three specific uh, front-end steps, right? So that would be your, your front-end workload, understanding that, that one user transaction what are they trying to do? What are the key components that are involved in that on the on the front end? Right? The the lower level transactions, units of work, are after you understand what those front end workloads are, to take the time to actually measure a few of those workloads as they go through your system and identify what are some of the key lower level, more IT friendly metrics that are required for each one of those front end workloads. So if you have one workload, you may know that that's going to generate um, a specific number of transactions in your system. Maybe those are transactions spread across different groups of, of internal applications. So maybe you have an authentication engine that uh, that would need to process the the auth credentials. Maybe you have a um, you know financial engine that will talk to Visa and Mastercard and so on to, to actually process the purchase. Maybe you have a CRM system that uh, that's going to be contacted as well, right? So you want to be able to relate 
translate that, that front-end workload back to what are some of those transactional uh, pieces that are required to make that front-end work. Um, I should point out we won't be able to get to all the questions. Some of these questions relate to uh, rather granular issues of platform dependency and uh, what platforms uh, Uptime works with. Those will be answered on an individual basis. Um, there is one here about what platforms you support, though, uh, David, and maybe can you give us a rundown of the major uh, operating systems? Yeah, absolutely. So, um, kind of all. <laughs> um, all of them. Uptime supports, uh, yeah, let's just say all of them. You know, Uptime fully supports uh, about 15 different major um, operating system brands. So, um, you know, of course, uh, your, your standard Windows servers environments. Um, uh, your Linux uh, server environments as well, um, also into more of the Unix environments, so Solaris uh, uh, P-series environments as well as uh, HP's platform, um, HPUX, right? So uh, we cover a number of different uh, Unix platforms, the Linux and Windows platforms, and also the, the technology stacks that goes all, go along with those, right? So Zones and Solaris and uh, VMware uh, virtualization platforms as well. Uh, with that, we are out of time. Uh, we do have a number of questions we weren't able to get to, but those will be uh, addressed in follow-up emails, so uh, don't uh, uh, keep an eye on your inbox for that. Uh, I'd like to thank David for joining us for a, a very uh, popular presentation with a lot of questions and uh, really thinking fast on his feet. Be sure to download the slides from the download link, and don't forget to check out the resources widget uh, for all those bonus resources that Uptime is providing. As I said earlier, this webcast uh, is archived or will be archived within the next 24 hours and will be available. There will be a, an email sent to you that will notify you of the archive, and we encourage you to please share that with your colleagues. Uh, we hope to see you at all of our future uh, Quinn, Street, Quinn Street webcasts. Uh, a reminder that there is a, a survey that will be popping up on your screen. We ask you to fill that out as a brief survey, but it's very important to us because it helps us to better focus our future events. For now, this is Paul Gillen signing off, thanking our sponsor for today, Uptime Software, our speaker, David Leith, and wishing you all a great afternoon.